So, you know, it's interesting because options themselves, I believe that they can positively contribute to portfolios. They are inherently path dependent. And so 2022 was a really interesting year where despite the fact that the market fell 20% over the course of the year, at no point in the year did we experience like really significant moves, right? The number of kind of down 10, down 20% sort of moves that we saw in 2020 just didn't happen in 2022. And in fact, actually most of the violent moves were to the top side. So it was kind of interesting to see that behavior. Again, that's consistent with some of my views on market structure, but was very frustrating from the standpoint of an options-based investor. Strategies that worked really well in 22 um, would be things like hedged equity programs where you're selling a call option to fund um, a put spread there you're not overpaying for volatility you're effectively funding the purchase of the downside protection with the sale of upside participation um, we have a product there that i'd highlight because it takes a slightly different approach recognizing this path dependency component competing products that are much larger in the hedged equity space will you know, do a series of quarterly options. So come September 30th, they will sell an out of the money call option for December 31st, and they will buy a put spread that's typically down five to 15% out of the money, right? That is basically a vol neutral exposure because I've sold the top side to finance a downside put spread. That strategy also has an interesting problem though, depending on where I am in the month or in my expiry cycle, I'm going to get very different response. So if I um, roll into new uh, put spreads, right? So that downside protection and the markets immediately fall, that downside put option retains a lot more value. Therefore, I get less benefit from it. Within our product, HEQT, what we've done is we've moved to a series of three rolling um, three month options. And so at every point in time, you're going to have options that are closer to maturity. You should get a much smoother response. It also reduces the rebalancing dynamic, the luck associated with that. Um, and finally, it actually gives you better strikes because you're continually resetting. So you're, you're, you constantly have stuff that is nearer the money or further out of the money in the form of the, the call spread or the call that you've sold. I love products like that because we're taking an idea that's already out there and we're applying a little bit more rigor to the design of the product. And it's doing exactly what we'd hope, delivering access performance. Um, within our um, convexity suite, we typically are taking a beta exposure to the S&P and then modifying that either with downside protection or with increased upside participation. That was a, that was a very challenging product for all the reasons that I highlighted earlier in the year. We've made a lot of investments to improve that, and we're excited for 2023. We're hoping that, that we can show much better performance there. Um, other option-based products that we have, um, PFIX is a product that we use in the interest rate space, an area where people don't typically think about options. PFIX is what's is long what's called a payer swap option. So it's been a, a beneficiary of rising interest rates. The real benefit to a payer swap option is some, compared to say shorting bonds is that it has positive convexity in your favor, right? Meaning I can risk a relatively small sum of capital and make multiples of that if I encounter much higher interest rates. Shorting bonds by definition has negative convexity, right? As the bond falls in price, the interest rates that I'm ultimately forced to pay rise, as well as the quantity that I'm short actually falls, right? So my losses are magnified relative to my gains as we move forward. So that would be another example of a product that we use. And then um, two others that I guess I would highlight, uh, one would be SVOL, which is our short volatility um, uh, basically, it's a uh, what's called a capped variance position. We would treat it as comparable to, say, a covered call strategy. There, we're explicitly shorting the UX futures, um, the kind of inverse VIX stuff. And for those who uh, have followed my career at all, like one of the trades that I did that was well known was betting on the blow up of those products back in 2018. That turned out extraordinarily well. We've taken the insights from that experience and incorporated that into SFAL, where we're buying protection at the same time that we're selling the overall index. 
giving us a better risk managed profile than you would have if you were simply short volatility. And then the last product I would just highlight is, is um, uh, actually there's two more I would highlight. One is CTA, which is a managed futures product that doesn't explicitly have options in it, but the trend following dynamics behave very much like an option. Mm. Um, that's an area that's super attractive if we're not sure about what's going to happen to prices. And again, as I'm highlighting, I'm suggesting that we have increased volatility more than certainty, yeah. right? And so I am attracted to things like trend following strategies that'll let the market guide us in that direction. And then the last one I would just highlight is the one that I run directly, which is FIG. Um, that's our macro ETF. That's basically a way of putting together all the pieces of our puzzle, you know, um, under an asset allocation framework where it becomes just to set it and forget it. And that's actually been a fun product to, to manage in the public ETF space. And what, what are the benefits of generally of, of, you know, going for an options ETF as opposed to something that does, doesn't include the option? The cleanest example is actually improved tax efficiency. So imagine a scenario where I'm long the S&P and protecting my portfolio through my own options. The S&P then falls in price my put options go into the money. I make money on my puts. Those puts are then immediately subject to taxation under varying rules, but by and large, it's short-term taxes on your options. And hopefully you haven't had to sell any of your underlying S&P exposure, right? Now, what that does is it means it's incredibly tax efficient. I pay taxes on the gains, but I don't get any benefit from the losses. And there's a couple of ways that that can be used to manage it. But by doing that inside an ETF, I improve that significantly. I also candidly am just taking away a lot of the responsibility from that. One of the reasons why registered investment advisors, you know, your traditional financial planner, et cetera, don't do a lot with options is, is that it's a very small portion of the portfolio, right? So within our flagship um uh, products in the convexity suite, like the option load should be kind of in the two to 3% of the portfolio range. We're spending a lot of time thinking about that two to 3% from an RIA standpoint or an asset, uh, an asset manager standpoint, that can be a real pain, you know, pain in the took us is I guess a technical term yeah. we can use there. Um, so, so those are the key advantages.